I'm not really from here. I was born in California, but I grew up in Missouri, so I consider that where I'm from. And my wife thinks I'm a Yankee. And I tried to convince her that Missouri is a southern state, because we did eat okra and fried green tomatoes. But uh, we didn't put sugar in our tea. So there was a lot of problems that she had accepting me as a southerner. I'd never heard of a boiled peanut in my life until I came here. I love them. Now, I have a daughter back there who's eating bowls of them right now, <laughs> so she loves them. But I'd never heard of, of, of black eyed well, black eyed peas maybe, but uh, Crowder peas, cream 40s, zipper peas, pink eyed purple hulls, which I think are a wonderful invention. So I think those are really good. But another thing. When I was in high school, in junior high and stuff like that, and learned about history, I never heard about the Spanish coming to settle in Florida. You know, it was always the English had come over in Jamestown in 1607, and the history books didn't mention any of this history that's happened right here. And so I uh, was a high school science teacher for nine years, and I taught in Nebraska, of all places. I didn't really swim. Well, I didn't swim, but just by sheer chance, I saw this book called The Sea Remembers, and it was about doing archaeology underwater, looking at shipwrecks and what they could tell us. And I just thought it was fascinating. fascinating. So I wasn't married, and I thought, yeah, what the heck. So I applied to Texas A&M University, ended up uh, earning a PhD in nautical archaeology, and then... Um, the ship was found in Pensacola in 1992, the first Emanuel Point shipwreck is what we called it. And so it was this Spanish ship, supposedly from 1559, and so I was invited to come here and work on that ship. I actually arrived in 1994, so I've been here you know, quite a few years now, but I think as far as my wife's concerned, I'm always going to be a Yankee, but I'm trying. <laughs> So I'm going to tell you about the project. So it's been my career now for 20 some odd years. And if you have questions, I'll, I'll be happy to answer them as we go through the talk. And you don't have to wait to the end if you want. So, you know, if you go to Pensacola, you know, you're going to see the name still today. Downtown Pensacola founded 1559, so we get to T. St. Augustine that were six years earlier than, than St. Augustine. I have some friends of mine who always argue about that because they work on shipwrecks over there. But De Luna Lanes, Tristan Towers, Via De Luna, and uh, condominiums called San De Luna, all these things. So we still have a little bit of this heritage, and Pensacola's got Spanish names, of course, Zaragoza, Terra. Uh, Tarragona and Bayou Tahar and all these great names, which come from the Spanish, not the first Spanish, but the second Spanish period. So, the Spanish were in Mexico before 1559, okay, and they found the riches of the New World. So, they were sending gold back to Spain, and silver, and, you know, other products as well. And, you know, all this land and mineral resources that they wanted. And so they were worried that the French in particular, and also the English, that they would come somewhere in the New World here and establish a base where they could launch ships from and could attack their treasure ships and such. And so uh, King Philip II of Spain authorized this expedition to Florida to start a new colony. This isn't the first settlement attempt. It's not the first one. It's actually the fourth by the Spanish. Okay, there was one other uh, colony on the east coast of the United States that lasted only a month. So Pensacola really can't rightly claim to be the first city, but this was a two-year uh, endeavor, as it turned out. It was the best finance. It was the biggest. And it consisted of 11 ships that were assembled in Mexico. So most of the ships were owned by the Spanish government. Some of them were leased from merchants. And a couple of them had been built in Mexico. The others had been built over in Spain. And, uh, but it was ships of different kinds and sizes, what they called uh, a galleon, uh, uh, a barca, which is a bark, a fregata, which we call a frigate. So 
a, a, a variety of these things. There was also a ship called a caravel. Now, we want to find the caravel, but the caravel survived the storm. And the caravel is the type of ship that Columbus actually came uh, over, you know, discovered the New World. But uh, of all these, there were 1,500 people, and colonists and soldiers. There were also Aztec warriors that they recruited. There was 200 Aztecs that came with them, women and children. And so a variety of people really wanted to start life in a new place and become rich. Uh, 240 horses on board. The horses didn't fare well on the voyage, and uh, most of them died. And you know, these ships they might have considered big at the time. We wouldn't today. You know, not really much over 100 feet in length, and putting all those horses on board. You know, it would have been uh, quite uh, you know a voyage. So this is the plan. They sailed from Veracruz, Mexico, but they had supplies from Spain. They had supplies from Mexico. Other things, all these things were gathered, placed on board. Fortunately, they kept a lot of records, so we know a lot of things that they purchased for this. The idea was to sail to Pensacola, what we call Pensacola. They called it Ochuse because it had been visited earlier by the Spanish. And the Spanish thought Pensacola Bay was this large, wonderful bay with abundant resources, deep water, and protected from all storms. <laughs> They also knew about a place called Cusa, okay? So Cusa's up here to the north, which they knew that there was a large Native American population, which the Spanish wanted to exploit. And it would be a food resource, you know, they could provide food to help get the colony going and things as well. Then they were going to build an overland road to uh, Santa Elena and connect the two. So very ambitious project. This is the actual route to get here, though. Okay, they go all the way up north, and then they go way south, and then they eventually shoot straight north. And it wasn't because they were lost; they knew what they were doing. It's they followed the currents that they knew to get to where they wanted to go. They actually overshot Pensacola. We know they went probably about as far as St. Marks, and then they came back and they actually went into Mobile Bay. They took the horses that survived, offloaded them in Mobile, and brought them overland. But five weeks after they arrived, there was a major hurricane. And they write about it. Tristan de Luna, he's the leader of the expedition. And from his description, it sounded like it was a Category 5 storm. He talks about the wind coming from all directions for a period of 24 hours. This was devastating. We've actually tracked the path of that hurricane by looking at historic records from Havana and Cuba and other places, some of the islands. We know when the storm hit, and it really followed the same path as we see some of the storms that have hit us. Where, where was the weather channel man then? <laughs> <laughs> and he's always there when the storm comes. So. They were, they were um, hit the wrong place. They went to Fort Myers. <laughs> <laughs> so when the, the Spanish arrived, they made a decision. And the decision was that they thought their food supplies, they brought food supplies to last year, but they thought the safest place for the food was on board the ships. So the ships had been anchored for five weeks when the storm hit with most of their food supplies, and so they lost almost all of that. Okay, so 11 ships came. Okay, one of them went back to Mexico and said, we made it, everything's good, but when the storm hit, of uh, those 10, Six of them sank in the bay. One of them was blown completely on land. So only three ships survived this. So from the get-go, they were having you know, disadvantages. But they did pick a site where they would build a colony. And there were certain things that they wanted, access to fresh water, uh, you know, a good view of the bay where they could protect themselves if need be. And so I'll talk a little bit about that, about the land site as well. So to understand all this, I, I do what's known as historical archaeology, which means I'm working in the historic period where there's written documents. And so we can, we can look at the archaeology, but we also have the record. And so we have various things. We have the letters they wrote. We have financial accounts. Um, we also have records where if someone died, 
you know, someone of high rank anyways, a letter would be written and an inventory of their goods would be collected. That was so their uh, survivor, their kin, um, could officially claim it if these documents were in order. And so they're great for us because they add to the story. But the documents don't tell the whole story, and that's what we want to do is use archaeology to tell the Tristan de Luna, the leader of the expedition up there in front, that comes from what's known as a codex. So we know the names of the ships, the Jesus, or the Jesus, the San Juan de Ulua, San Andreas, and a second ship called San Juan de Ulua. They really like that name. Santa Espiritus, and others here, and these are arranged by the size of the ship and the number of the crew. And so we have a variety of ship types. So if you're a nautical archaeologist, this is a great laboratory because you not only get to look at one type, hopefully we'll find all these ships eventually and, and really get a great understanding of what 16th century shipbuilding was actually like. Because they didn't have detailed plans to show how they built the ships. So the first wreck, a manual point one, was discovered in 1992. I was invited to come work on the wreck in 1993, but I was committed to work in Lake Champlain, so I was way up there working in much colder water, but I did come in 1994 and I've been here ever since. And we worked on that ship up until 1998, and we uncovered about 40% of it. And archaeologists, we don't excavate the whole site today because we leave part of it buried because other people have other questions and we can come back and we can still look at that. But this is a good idea. What we have are the bottoms of the ships, and they're really protected well because they have all this ballast in the bottom. The ballast were these heavy stones to weight the ships to counteract the torque of the tall mast and such. But that protects that wood, particularly if it gets covered and buried quickly and uh, it's not exposed to the moving water or bacteria and the like. So, this is Pensacola Bay in really good visibility. And so in the winter time, we might get five feet of visibility. In the summer, when it gets hot like this, and we got a lot of uh, particulates in the water, we might have just three or four inches of visibility. Mm -hmm. And we can work in that. So if anybody would have taken you up on your offer to come out and dive, um, they might have felt some things. I can put their hands on parts of the ship, but they might not be able to see it. And we'll talk about that a little bit. But to do the work, we're, we have such great advantages because we have an excavation platform. We use students from the university. We also get students who come from other universities that want to participate. We have a dive safety program. We keep everybody really safe. And we take small boats. And we're only half a mile from shore. It's right by the graffiti bridge at the end of 17th Street in Pensacola. That's where the ships are located. And we go to work each morning on these boats. I wear swimming trunks and flip-flops is my normal attire to go to work. How deep is the water? 12 feet. Emmanuel Point 1, that's the first ship we found. It's in 12 feet. Emmanuel Point 2, the second one we found, it's in, also in 12 feet. And they're both on a, the same sandbar. And so it's real evident that the hurricane took these ships and it drove them up to the sandbar, they pounded up and down, and then they broke apart like this. We found a third one uh, in 2016, and that one's in seven feet of water, which is remarkable. But it suggests that it's a smaller <laughs> ship, and so it was, it, it was able to go further inland, or further in the water up there. And we're excited about that one, because it, it'd probably be a different ship type than the others. But there's a good example of students and, we find things are holding a stone cannonball, and they get real excited. I've been doing this for all this time, and uh, I get more excited today by watching the students' excitement when they find something. Some of it's just broken pottery, but um, to them, you know, they found something from 1559, you know, 459 years old. So we find things like this, and. Uh, sometimes we know immediately what they are, sometimes we don't. We have to do research to figure it out. One thing we do sometimes, we look at old paintings, because some of the paintings that were made, the clothing that they, were, they wore is painted very accurately, 
and the items in their household that they used, and we can compare it to it. This is a very famous painting by a man named Velazquez, Woman Cooking Eggs. And this type of vessel that she's using here, it's a red lead glazed ceramic, which we found, you know, the exact pieces to. She's going to serve it on a type of plate uh, called Mahalika, Mahalika. We have that. She would grind her spices in a mortar and pestle. Of course, we found that as well. Copper cooking cauldrons. And these are olive pits. And so um, things are preserved so well, we find the food remains. Okay. Now, treasure hunters, we don't like because they don't care about that stuff. They only want the gold and silver, and they just blast through a lot of these things, which tell the whole story. So even those olive pits, the, the man that hired me, his name was Roger Smith. He's Florida State underwater archaeologist. And so he said, what else can we learn about the olive pits? So I went to the grocery store in Pensacola, because I like olives, and I bought a can of olives, and they were made, uh, sold by Vlasic, like Vlasic Pickle. So I called Vlasic Pickle on the phone, and I said, you have an olive expert? And they said, well, we buy our olives uh, from Campbell's Soup. They're our parent company. You need to call Campbell's Soup. So I called Campbell's Soup, and they said, you need to talk to the California Olive Growers Association. <coughs> so I just made a phone call. This man says, are they in good shape? And I said, yeah, they really are. He says, put them on a photocopier with a ruler, and then make an image, fax it to me. And I did, and then an hour later, he had sent me a report and said, you have two kinds of olives. You have a type called the Mission Olive, so-called because Spanish missionaries brought them to the New World, and you have a type called the Gordal. You go, one has a high olive oil content, and the other one has a nice meaty olive that you can eat. And so we, we make these fun phone calls to people, and they get excited when you tell them it's from a ship that sank in 1559. We didn't find any cannons. We haven't found a single cannon. We know that they were armed to protect themselves, but the ships, after the storm wrecked them, the Spanish were able to go out and salvage them. So most likely they took the cannons to shore to defend the new colony. But we find quite a few of the shot, and so we know the different types of guns that were carried aboard. Some of them shot these large stone round balls from these gun stone throwers, and they were designed to hit and break up into shrapnel. And then smaller ones for small swivel guns and some for shoulder-mounted weapons. Some very, very soft wood here. And it's a wheel to a cannon carriage. And off the stern of the first shipwreck, we found this piece of armor. And so, it's all concreted, we call it, this incrustation, this mineral that forms on it because of the iron begins to rust and it causes the minerals in the seawater to collect around it. And eventually the iron will completely go away, but that mineral-like material will preserve the shape and uh, form a natural mold that we can cast and we can make replicas of it. So to learn more about it, I took it to Sacred Heart Hospital and I had it CAT scanned. And we put it on a gurney, and we were rolling it down the hall like a patient. <laughs> we went in and we tried to shoot it. The machine wouldn't work because the amount of energy that we needed to penetrate that was more than a human can have. So we had to get some people in to override the safety systems, and then we made all these great images of it. We had this replica made uh, by the same people that make armor for the Tower of London. And this was identified as probably being made in Italy around 1540. And it was for a foot soldier as opposed to a soldier who had um, ridden a horse. And so it's, it's cut different for him. And it's actually a size large. And we're casting the original uh, from the actual concretion. That's part of an arrow for a crossbow. We found an anchor on the first ship. It was actually in the bow of the ship, and uh, it didn't have the stock, so they couldn't have used the anchor to try to save the ship. It was just carried there, but inoperable, so it stayed with the ship. It weighs about 1,200 pounds. And so my job, I act as the conservator for the project. I'm the guy that's supposed to take care of all the artifacts. 
And so I clean this using various techniques to remove that concretion that's on it. I have to remove the salts and then make sure that the iron will no longer rust and things like that. This is in the T.T. Wentworth Museum if you want to see it. Wait, wait. Yeah. Well, how much did you say it weighed? 1,200 pounds. Okay. This is not a big anchor either. <laughs> Even for the time period, this one's not a huge anchor. Spanish anchors, there's a, a thing about Spanish anchors is that they were notoriously weak. And there's an expression, weak is a Spanish anchor. So, but I think this storm was so significant that even it wouldn't matter how many anchors they had out. We found artifacts that we can directly associate with the Aztecs as well. We found pottery, we found tools made out of obsidian, volcanic glass, and we know exactly which valley in Mexico uh, that obsidian was originally collected. We do a, a test called neutron activation analysis tells us the trace minerals, and we can say it came from this particular valley in Mexico. I love this eye. When we found it, it was staring up at you on the bottom. So we find lots of pottery. That's the first clue we use as archaeologists to get an idea of the date or the nationality. And so the pottery that we found was typically Spanish, and it was also 16th century. And so we were real careful at first. We didn't want to say it was a ship from Tristan de Luna's fleet until we had an overwhelming abundance of evidence to say confidently it is. It's not treasure ships. So these were poor colonists. But we did find a couple coins. And so this first little coin that's kind of hard to see there, it's kind of in fragments. That coin was minted between 1471 and 1474. It's a very small coin. It's made out of copper and silver. And then the second coin here is a Tumrial. And it's very characteristically Spanish. It has what's known as the Pillars of Hercules. And it's got a shield that has a castle and a lion on it and all the symbology that goes with the time period. But it has a mint mark on it, which is an M. It was minted in Mexico City, probably in 1556. And then on the bottom there, those are coin weights. They were used on a balance scale to weigh coins of other countries. So on some shipwrecks, you may not have good organic preservation. We have excellent organic preservation, which means we can find wooden items, we find leather shoe soles, we find the olive pits, we found cherry, we found plum, we found tropical fruit seeds called sapote, and it gives an idea of what were they eating, what did they bring with them. Um, down here in the warm water, what, how do you end up having better preservation? It's because it's, it's completely buried under that ballast, and so we're, we're removing the light, we're, we're uh, removing the oxygen. There's very little oxygen when you get down several feet in the thing. And if you can take away those things, then you get the really good preservation, even with the warmer water. Hmm. Okay, now when you talk about 12 feet of water, yep. uh, then how much deeper than in the sand are you having to work? In, in some cases, we're five feet under the sand. We have to move a lot of sediment. It's, how how is, do you move it? Uh, with a thing, I'm going to show you. I've got okay. a little video. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, no, it's okay. I, I hope the video works because I'm going to show you exactly how we you do it. You should be sorry. You should be sorry. If you ever find any silver and gold on like the some old silver and gold from the other country? The treasure ships didn't come up this far. They had a, a different route where they went to Havana and then they turned, they went up the east coast and then they followed the currents and they would turn left, turn right rather, mm -hmm. to head back to Spain. So there was no reason for them ever to be in this area. And so we're not going to get that lucky to find a bunch of gold and silver. Well, they had two or three back at the Luna or something where they had a lot of silver and gold on it. The treasure hunters, you know. That one of the group, though. They... Right. The, there's what they call the treasure coast of Florida is on the east coast. And there were a lot of ships wrecked there, and then there were some wrecked off the coast of Texas that had treasure on board. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is the fact that they were underneath the silt the reason why they were not discovered? I mean, you know, people have been fishing and swimming and Absolutely. everything, and that's not very deep. Nope. So there was nothing that you could see really on the surface. 
how, how would they, how do they find them? If we found the first one with an instrument, uh, it's called a magnetometer. And the magnetometer is sensitive to the Earth's magnetic field. And it's measured in a value we call nanoteslas. And for Pensacola, Florida, we get a reading of about 47,900 nanoteslas. And we pull it behind the boat. And then if it passes over an iron cannon, an iron anchor, or even the ballast in the ship will have enough iron in it, it, it'll change that reading in that little isolated area. We call it an anomaly. And we dive down on that and we poke in the sand to see if there's something buried. So we find a lot of things that aren't shipwrecks doing that. One time we found a pizza oven. One time we found a Volkswagen. Yes. Uh, so it, it takes a lot of time. It's why it took us. We found the first ship in 1992 with the thing called the magnetometer. Okay. In 1992, we didn't have GPS. Computer technology wasn't quite what it was today, so the way we did it was we would take out a, a Clorox bottle, tie a brick to it, and throw it down. Then we'd use the compass, we'd go a quarter mile away, we'd throw in a second float, we would drive between them, and then we would move them over 10 feet. But we, that's how the first one was found. We found the second one in 2006, also with this device called the magnetometer, completely buried, but my students went in the water, and then using a fiberglass rod, they hit the ballast. And then the third one found in 2016, again, was with this instrument called the magnetometer. Well, was, some, were you, was, was someone looking for it because of the historical we accounts were, and things? Y'all were? Specific, yeah, we specifically de designed a survey plan to look for these ships. And we obtained grant money from the state of Florida that allowed us to do that. And, uh, and just with due diligence, it's taken this many years to find the three. There's still three more out there that we haven't found yet. Right. But you were looking because of the historical records. Yes. Okay. So you knew there were, they must be DeLuna ships. You knew that. No. We did, from the type of pottery and some of the artifacts that were found <clears throat> initially, we were really confident that we'd found it back when I came in 94. We didn't want to be embarrassed and then say that right away until we had so much evidence that it had to be. And so the first one was found in 1992, but it wasn't until 1998 that we definitively said it was. But when we found the second one in 2006, we were able to say it very quickly because we knew from the location and the same type of materials that were Finding. But it was still it was still after 2006 before you ever defined where the land site was. Yes. And you were all over it. You. Right. Okay. Now that's that. Yeah. It, it hindsight's 2020. But we thought the hurricane could have pushed these ships really any number of places. So we weren't certain where the land site was. One idea, we were trying to second guess the Spanish, where would they put the land site? So some people thought it was where the Navy base is today, because you got the great view and all that. They talk about the Rojo Barrancas, the, the red bluffs, from their descriptions. And, but you know, we've got red bluffs in a number of places here, and so it did totally narrow it down as well. Well, as it turns out, if you know where the land site is, it's a big secret, but it's in this <coughs> hill, and uh, right there, everybody knows where it is, I think now. But it overlooks where our ships are. But until we found it, you know, we, it could have been other places. Some people thought it was over by Gulf Breeze, but they're actually they're right there in the same place as it turns out. And the land site was just found a couple of years ago. And so again, with, I've shown you the pictures of the barrels and things. We find other food remains, and so we have people help us identify them. We found cow, pig, chicken, sheep or goat, various kinds of fish. Okay. And then my favorite is we found rats, lots of rat bones. So we know the ships carried rats. We know they have cockroaches on board as well. We found cockroach parts galore. But we found a ship's cat which is kind of surprising. It's a little sad. And, they, and we know that the cat had kittens because we also found the remains of kittens. But cats weren't really well liked in the 16th century, so this is really unusual to find the cat on board. Dogs are actually better at killing rats than cats are. But we have this cat. We want to know more about it because this may be one of the first cats in the New World. 
So I've taken one of the cat's vertebrae and sent it to Belgium. And there's a project there called the Ancient Cat DNA Study. And they're going to tell us about the origins of this cat. And they were really excited to, to hear about the discovery of this cat. So I'm waiting for them to do their results, their tests, and we'll find out more about the cat. We also had mice on board. Okay, here's a game for you. What is this? A uh, pipe cleaner and Swiss Army knife. Well, the Swiss knives. Spanish Army knife. It's a it's an ivory manicure set. Okay. Okay. And so it it's a it, the blades are obviously fold together like a Swiss Army knife, and it's only about this long, but it's made out of hand carved out of ivory, and it's beautiful. So you could use it as a toothpick. You could clean your fingernails with it. It's missing one arm. If you can see, there's two on one side. It should have had two on the other side. I'm hoping we're still going to find it on the wreck. The missing arm more than likely ended in a little tiny spoon. And that was used to remove earwax from your ear. <laughs> but the really neat thing, if you have good eyes, there's a reed in there. It's a whistle. Okay. So this was a very a luxury item at the time. This belonged to someone who regretted losing it. It was a very nice thing to carry at the time. It might have been Loomis. So we use excavation grids. We actually have an aluminum grid framework. I'll see like this sometimes. We'll just map that small area. We draw it, we photograph it, we look at it real carefully. And we do enough areas to give us an idea of what the ship might have looked like very accurately actually and how it was built and all the details that we can find with that. So this is the middle of the ship, this is the mast depth, this was the base of the main mast of the ship was set in place, this is the bow area, this is the stern, these are gudgeons that we call them, they hold the rudder to the ship. And then we have this large area here, which was the side of the ship that was torn off and fell behind it. So, sir, you were only, you're specifically not excavating the whole thing. Correct. For cost or? No, not, <coughs> not so much for cost. Um, we use them uh, to train students, but we're also, uh, there's, the, Kind of the trend in archaeology is leave part of the site for the future. If other questions, techniques, tests, you can go back to it and you can look at it again. Because the ships are they're not near images, but one side does tend to look like the other. And if we can look at one side of it, or we look at cross sections in various places, we can get a pretty good idea of what the entire thing looked like. So we can save that. This is the... Uh, this is called the pump well. This is a very large timber called the keelson, and the base of the mast was set in place here and secured. These are <coughs> timbers here are called buttress timbers to support <coughs> all that structure. This is the housing that was built to go around the pump well. Now you see all those pieces assembled? We didn't actually do that. This is the new technology that's in place now that my students know how to use because they're smarter than I am now with computers. So these are the individual pieces and then using a computer to reconstruct them. So each piece we bring up, it's photographed from bunches and bunches and bunches of angles. We use the computer then to recreate it as a model and we reassemble it virtually. So we never actually put those pieces together. The computer did it for us. And a smart student named Charles. Uh, he loved to tease. So the third ship, we found the third one in 2016. This one's the one that's in seven feet of water. It's in sand instead of mud and silt. So this build is much better. So we, I have a little video here. Well, I thought it did.
And that's called a water induction dredge. It's, it's a vacuum cleaner, basically. So we remove it. the keel, they set some of the ribs of the ship, they're called the floors, and on top of that they put the keel in and makes a very strong structure, and then these ribs curve up to form the sides of the ship. So this is the outer hull planking, and then these are these framing timbers, they have funny names like futics and things like that, but this is what we're trying to expose carefully and record in detail, photograph it, but we're looking for all the artifacts that are mixed with it. What type of wood is that? Well, that's an excellent question. So we brought in um, Professor Nigel Nailing all the way from Wales, who is a dendro archaeologist that's sitting right there. Please stand up. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. <laughs> so he speaks English. Nigel answered the question. What type of wood is it, Professor Nailing? It's Wood from trees. <laughs> That's good. All the way. It's it's from oak trees. It's from oak trees, but we still haven't discovered whether it's from oak trees from Spain, oak trees from Mexico. Theoretically, it could be oak trees from North America. But the probability is there are oak trees from Spain, and we have to do some tests, further tests, to find out. So we've been taking samples, and those samples are now in the laboratories of the university. And I'll take some of those back to do a whole series of tests on, uh, which I hope will help us to answer those questions. So Nigel's been doing this for a long time. He has his own shipwreck. And so this is his. This is the, it's called the Newport ship. And his has a building coming up out of it. But it was discovered when they were building this building that they had an entire ship there. So uh, remember the mast step I showed you? This is the mast step on this ship. Those same buttress timbers come here, but he's got a kind of piling coming out of this one. So this ship was completely raised and conserved and stabilized, and so uh, uh, much more studies happened on that one today. But to take the wood samples then, so I had to put this in. This is a hero shot, Nigel and I diving just a few days ago. But this wood has been underwater for 459 years old. But look at this. You can still see the rings for the annual growth rings in this. And these are called rays, characteristic of oak. But uh, this is what uh, we're doing in the lab. We'll be doing it tomorrow as well. Is Nigel's taking all this information back, and it's going to help answer questions about 16th century forestry pro process and uh, tell us much more than just things about our ship. I noticed on there uh, those students wasn't using any gloves of any kind. You all don't have any uh, worries about this flesh eating? Um, a, lot of do, a lot of students do wear gloves. Depends on what we're doing. If we're handling the ballast and things like that, we're just barring things on us, it's real sharp, we wear gloves. I tend not to ever wear gloves because I want my sense of feel down there. It's not very cold, so my hands don't get too cold. Um, I'm not worried about the flesh eating. Maybe, you know, I've been diving in Pensacola waters for 24 years, something like that. And I've seen one shark, which was way out in the Gulf of Mexico, though. The only thing we really have any problems with is sometimes is jellyfish. And every once in a while we'll get what they call sea nettles, and they can come in. And they, they're annoying to me. Some people are a little more sensitive to them. But we have a dive safety program, and we, other than the gloves, they tend to wear wetsuits and be protected. But no, we haven't had any problems with that. This is just something that was found yesterday. I just put it in for fun. But um, Gulf Power is digging up 
uh, uh, areas of streets, Jefferson Street right now, they're replacing a lot of their power lines that are down the ground. And so we're, UWF is monitoring all that to look in case archaeological deposits are found. This is a, uh, a barrel, but it's a barrel well. And so to dig a, you dig the well instead of lining it with brick, you can do it quickly by just putting barrels in the ground on top of each other. This was the bottommost barrel in that well. So I showed it to Nigel, and you can see how excited he was. It's more <laughs> tree wood that he can look at. Okay, and then you mentioned uh, the settlement. So I just have a few slides, and I'm going to finish. But um, we now have the settlement, land site as well. It was a chance, and noticed a vacant lot that had just been cleared to build a new house. He walked through it, had his eye to the ground, and he saw some pottery, which he thought looked like it was important, so he brought it up to the university. It was 16th century olive jar, and we found the land site. It's the biggest 16th century land site to date. It, and even though they were only here for two years before eventually they were picked up and taken home, the survivors anyways, they did have a colony, they, they had buildings built, there certainly would have been a cemetery, there would have been a church, and so we're now looking at the land site. We can compare what we find on the ships to what was being found on the land. So it's a, it's a great research project. Uh, we let undergraduate students do it. No, nobody else really does it to the extent that we do, as well as graduate students. And so it, it's, it, it's a good way to study archaeology right here in Pensacola. So that's the view from where the land site, that's where our ships are. So, look at the beautiful way they can uh, dig excavation units and large things that get down to the original floor level where the Spanish occupation was. This is Dr. John Worth, he's in charge of the land excavation. We have students that take what's called a combined field school. They get to do five weeks on the land site and they spend five weeks with us underwater. So they're trained in both methods. And so artifacts from the land site compare really well to the ships. Crossbow tips for the arrows, pieces of armor, chain mail, spikes, nails for building stuff, wire, um, some really pretty trade beads. Uh, a balance scale weight that probably the treasurer of the colony owned at one time. Things that you you know would see recognized today, even though it was from 1559. Thimbles, things. An enema pump nozzle that was unexpected. Boy. So we're going to be doing this for many more years to come. Uh, we'll hope to find three more <coughs> eventually. To, to complete the inventory in the bay. And the land site work's going to go on for some time. But uh, that's how I spend my summers. Yes? So you have students really from all over the United States and the world. We have one uh, with us this summer who's from Belgium. She came all the way from Belgium to participate in this project. And, uh, yep? How do you protect it legally to keep others out of it? I mean, you can. I mean, on the land, I would think that'd be easier than in the city, in the bay. Is there what? What did you have to do to legally prevent anybody from going and stealing things and that kind of thing? Well, all three ships are owned by the state of Florida. Okay, so I have to get permits from the state of Florida to do the excavation. I have to get a permit to do the, the dredging to remove the silt sediment from the, the uh, DEP, and we get all those permits in place. Uh, but we mentioned earlier, the visibility is so poor, you can't see them from the surface. I think people know probably where they are because we have that platform out there. Yeah. But we've been really, really lucky as nobody's <coughs> disturbed them over the years. Mm -hmm. Fish and Wildlife is right across the street. They know that if they see boats that don't look like UWF boats, they're going to go and talk to them, particularly on weekends. Um, we've also invited some of the sport divers who are really interested to come with us. So we had a day where we just allowed those guys we gave them a talk, much like I just did. We took them out to the site and we uh, led them around underwater. We gave each one, a, a student or myself, 
to, to a tour of the site, and they really appreciated it because they felt they could see it then. So we've been, I mean, it's just really people being good. That's good. Yeah. About a year ago, you were called over to Mobile, I believe, when they thought they had found the last slave ship Correct. because of uh, river currents or whatever, but we found out it was not. Correct. We were called, uh, we went on January 20th, and it was 33 degrees that day, and a reporter who writes for uh, AL.com had been looking for it. He talked to one of the descendants of the original uh, um, slave population um, where the ship was and thought he knew the location. So the Clotilde story is slavery had been illegal for years, but uh, a man from Mobile named Mir made a bet that he could send a ship to Africa, he could buy slaves, bring them back in undetected into the United States. So he did that. He, he went to uh, what's called Benin today. It was called Dahomey at the time. He purchased 125 slaves and then placed 110 of them on the ship uh, because he saw a sail on the horizon, so he got scared. So he only took 110. He sailed back to Mobile, but news kind of traveled ahead of him. And so he got uh, worried that he would be caught, so they took it up into all those 10 mile... Uh, where, where Africa Town is. Where Africa Town is okay. today, correct. So the <coughs> slaves were offloaded on the island and uh, the ship was burned and to, to hide the evidence. So the reporter thought he had found the ship, so he contacted myself and my colleague, Greg Cook, and said, come look at this. So we said, well, we have to get a permit from the state of Alabama to do that. He was worried that if we asked for that permit, the story would get out before he could really write up his story. So we, we said, well, if we come, we can look, but we can't, we can't take anything, we can't disturb it in any way, or we'll get in trouble. And he said, just come look at it. So the water was low enough that we could see part of the ship a little bit. So what we saw, we told him that we didn't see anything that said it wasn't Clotilde, and we saw a lot of things that said it was from the right time period and made perhaps the right type of ship. So we certainly, you know, got the story more excited. When he put his story out, it went nationwide, because everybody really thought this was to find that particular ship. Okay. Well, then the Alabama Historical Commission uh, owns the ship, just like Florida owns them here. And so it took until April, until everyone was allowed to go back out there, and then it was all covered up by water and actually do some measurements and be able to do the type of things we couldn't do in January. And at that point, it was concluded the ship was too long and it wasn't Clotilda. Clotilda's still there, and uh, there's a company called Search that uh, I've been told is going to be given the contract to go and look for it. But, so the story is not over with. Okay, uh, just like this ship belongs to Alabama, the party. Any underwater object you find belongs to the state? Yes. Well, if it's in state waters. And, uh, okay, if, uh, off, you know, I go over here to Scandal River, all right? State and, and I find an anchor or whatever mm -hmm. down there. Does it belong to the state? Yes. Now, if you own land as an individual, that belongs to you. But, that, but you don't own a river. It's, well, the state owns up to the high tide line. Okay. Right. So they would own what's in the river, but you, but what's on land shares with the only exception is uh, burials. Okay. So there, there's a gray area. It's what we talk about. It's called uh, isolated find, mm -hmm. like a really neat bottle someone finds in the river. Okay. It's not associated with a historic site. So that is kind of gray area whether you can collect it or not legally. But if it's a shipwreck, it's protected um, by archaeological rules that are set in place right now. Our ships, we can nominate them, uh, we did, for the National Historic Register. That gives federal protection if somebody disturbs it. And the uh, fines and things can be very high then if, once they get that protection, though. Yes? Going a little further north, you ever been to Oak Island? <laughs> I've not been to Oak Island, but I've done the story you're, you're, you're referring to. 
and see, yeah, that's been going on for years, and it's a great story, but again, it made a nice TV, reality TV show, but they always some difficulty, and they can never quite get down into that, but it, but it makes for good reading, though. Every episode, yeah. Yeah. Well, isn't there something in today's paper, yesterday's paper, the treasure hunters or something, or... Uh, some kind of TV program or, or searching Scambia River for sunken treasure or right. last it, night. It was a TV show that aired last night. Okay. And it was, it was uh, two of Jacques Cousteau's grandsons. Okay. Okay. We heard about the story in February because we heard someone was looking for a treasure ship in the Scambia River. We didn't know anything about it because um, the Northwest Florida Daily News the newspaper called us. And we said, we don't know anything about it, and if anybody was doing that, they would have to have permits to do it all. That's all we knew about it at the time. Then yesterday, that TV show aired last night, which I found out about it because my wife got a phone call, but it came way too late for us to watch the show. And uh, so they, the newspaper contacted uh, John Worth, because he excavated a site up by Molino, which is where this happened, I guess, asking him if there was any truth to this possible treasure ship, and it was buried, the treasure taken off and buried in a mound. And then he said of all the research that he's been doing for years now, he's never found a reference to that. So that's as much as I know, but it sounded like the show was pretty good because the water was cold and they had some challenging conditions. But I, I, the Facebook link I looked at today said that they used something called LIDAR, that they had a drone flying over it. And LIDAR is kind of like radar that's used from the air, and it shows you highs and lows, that they had three promising targets. But again, it's kind of like the Oak Island thing. Okay. Um, no, real, no real proof yet. The DeLuna expedition. Most of them, because of that, it was five weeks after they landed. So there were very few people on the ships. Um, there, there, there were certainly um, a number who did lose their lives. We don't know the exact number right now, but we know there were some, actually, some a few people that were on the ships that were, you know, associated as the, the naval people that stayed on board. We know that the ship called the El Jesus, the captain was named Diego Lopez. He drowned, and um, so we have his estate records. That it, it, it gives a nice account of what happened to him. But the, the actual number, we don't know that today yet. Yes? Did the colony, did anybody stay there after the hurricane? Or did they all, what happened to it after the hurricane? What happened after the hurricane was they were, they were running out of food. So they, 200 of the soldiers uh, went into Alabama. And they were trying to trade items for food with the Native Americans. They kept moving up north trying to find more because the Native American population had some food, but not that much that they wanted to feed all these hungry Spanish at the time. So they kept moving further north. They went all the way to the North Georgia mountains. And uh, uh -huh. artifacts have been found on Na Native American sites that we know were probably traded from the Luna expedition. Okay. The, DeSoto, though, came up in that same area, but DeSoto wasn't nice at all to the Native Americans. So they had a distrust of the Spanish already in, at 1559, and so they didn't really want to be that uh, friendly with them. So letters, of course, you know, uh, news of this eventually did reach with those three ships that survived Mexico, and then relief expeditions, there were about four of them that were sent. They would take people back and they would bring supplies. And eventually, after two years, everyone was taken away. Luna basically uh, was not an effective leader after he lost all of the ships and such. He uh, eventually made it to Havana, went back to Spain, and died penniless. Although he had married a very wealthy woman, and he was on the Coronado expedition, uh, he lost all his money, his personal money, as part of this. And so he died a poor man. He's buried in Spain today. And uh, the Spanish really don't know much about him because it was a failure. And so I met the king and queen of Spain. They came to Pensacola uh, just a number of years ago. Not the current king and queen. That's his son. But the former... Uh, 
uh, King Juan Carlos and Queen Sophia. So they came and we told them the story. They were more interested in Galvez because Galvez is a, is a hero to the, our, war of, uh, our war of independence as well as to Spain. And so that's what they were interested in. But they were, they were polite. They listened to me for a little bit. <laughs> These yes. ships, when they came over, would they be a 10-year-old ship or a 100-year-old ship or brand new wreck first voyage? In this time period, the average lifespan of a ship was about 20 years. And uh, so they could, they could be anywhere. There were a couple of ships that were fairly new that were built uh, in Mexico. Um, these ships right now, because of the wood species we're looking at, we're thinking were ones that were built in Spain. Um, and so they had some age on them. They protected over the, the caulking seams between the planks. They had nailed, tacked, lead strips over all of them. But, um, so we would have a mixture of, but probably none of them were older than 20 years. Yes? You talk about how these ships is made. Now, I saw on Facebook, believe it or not, the other day, uh, they were talking about the Titanic. And he said, remember, the Titanic was built by engineers. The art was built by amateurs. <laughs> yes, sir. Um. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you.